Rav Cook, selected letters translated and annotated by T. Feldman. Chapter 1, Torah and Science. A quote from Orot. The Holy One, blessed be he, favoured his world in that he did not put all abilities in any one place, not in any one man, nor in any one generation, and not in one world, but dispersed them. This is the first of three letters addressed to Rav Moshe Seidel, a young student in Bern, Switzerland. Seidel had met Rav Cook while studying at Yeshiva Teltz, and the latter advised him to pursue a career in biblical studies and Semitic languages. Seidel later became a well-known opponent of modern biblical criticism. But in these letters, Rav Cook responds to the young man's difficulty with seeming contradictions between science and secular knowledge. On the one hand, and Torah on the other. <clears throat> Here Rav Cook deals with evolutionary theory and geology and the relation to the biblical story of creation. He argues that the scientific theories enrich rather than contradict the tradition and points out that, unlike religious truths, theories are revised or rejected as man learns more. This is uh, Rav Cook's Response. By the grace of God, the holy city of Jaffa may be built and established. 10th of, 10th of Sivan 5665. That's the 13th of June 1905. Peace and blessings to my beloved friend, Rav Moshe Seidel, Chatan Torah, filled with knowledge and the awe of God. May he live a long and good life. Amen. Your pleasant letter has arrived, and if there was sufficient time, it would be appropriate to elaborate at great length and explain the root of all the issues you raised, as well as important matters of religious philosophy growing out of them. The failure to understand comes from not taking proper care, to inquire and not seeking the appropriate guidance. Everyone attempts to solve his own major questions with insufficient information and thus reaches distorted conclusions. It is our responsibility to clarify the expression of truth in the true Torah. On the matter of the Midrash, this is the, a reference to the difficult Midrash on Genesis 1.11. It states that God willed the wood of each tree to be as edible as its own fruit. The earth, however, did not, did not do this, but brought forth only trees bearing fruit. When Adam was cursed on account of his sin, the earth too was punished because of its sin. Rav Cook explains the Midrash metaphorically. The metaphor of the fruit and the tree with the same taste is an example of a world with abundance of good, so much so that with such affluence manca mankind is bound to stray. As King Solomon states, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but provide me with my daily bread, lest, being sated, I renounce, saying, Who is the Lord? This is from Proverbs 38 to 9, and is written in the Torah. Yeshurin, the Jewish nation, grew fat and kicked. Then he forsook God who made him and lightly esteemed the rock of, the, of his salvation. That's in Deuteronomy 32:15. And back to the letter. On the matter of the Midrash, the straightforward explanation is that were it not for man's inability, on account of his free will, to accept such an abundance of good, the creation would have been still more blessed and the taste of the tree would have been like that of its fruit. This is just an illustration showing that all, the, that all other forces would have been more blessed too. Since, however, man was destined to depart from the righteous path, when faced with an abundance of good, an ethical constraint arose preventing perfection in the world. A footnote. An ethical constraint, a justification for restraining the abundance, the abundance of good which would make the world perfect, since man by his nature cannot live in a perfect world without sinning. Back to the letter. This explains all the imperfections found in creation, which so occupy its critics. The gist of this matter will be understood only when the unity of the ethical force with all other forces of the cosmos is comprehended. This is what is called the sin of the earth, which the Midrash explains as analogous to one who curses the breasts of a wicked person's, one, wicked person's mother. 
As to the calculation of a number of years since the creation in relation to the calculation of today's geologists, uh, footnote, according to the traditional calculations based on the Bible, the world was created in six days in the year 3760 BCE, while according to scientific theories, the world was created billions of years ago. Back to the letter. It is generally accepted among Torah scholars that there were many earlier epochs preceding our recorded epoch. This was common knowledge among all our early Kabbalists and is mentioned in Bereshit Rabbah, uh, part, chapter 5, 3 and 9. He was building worlds and destroying them. That's a quote. Indeed, in the Zohar's commentary on the first portion of uh, Vaikra Leviticus, it is written there, it is written that there were other species of humans in addition to the Adam mentioned in the Torah. However, one must understand, one must understand well, the profound words of the Zohar, which need very comprehensive explanation. Excavations may teach us that there were living creatures, including humans, in prehistoric periods, but there is no proof that there was not in the interim a planetary cataclysm and a new creation. Rather, there is just an unsubstantiated hypothesis and evolution that need not worry us. But actually, we do not need this idea, since even if it were proven true, that is, evolution, that the order of creation was through the evolution of the species, this would not contradict our calculation of time. We count according to the literal text of the Torah's verses, which is much more meaningful than all the knowledge of prehistory which has little relevance to us. The Torah certainly obscures the meaning of the act of creation and speaks in allegory, uh, allegories and parables. For indeed, everyone knows that the stories of Genesis are part of the hidden Torah, the Kabbalah. And if all these narratives were taken literally, what secrets would there be? The Midrash states that to reveal the power of the act of creation to flesh and blood is impossible, and therefore the text, in the beginning God created, Genesis 1.1, is worded vaguely. What is most important about the act of creation is what we learn in regard to the knowledge of God and the truly moral life. The Holy One, who precisely measures out even the revelation of the prophets, has determined that only through the images of the stories of Genesis would mankind, with great effort, be capable of drawing out all that is beneficial and exalted in the great matters inherent in the act of creation. The precious light and kippa on. Uh, footnote, Rav Cook is referring to Rav Eliezer's explanation in Psachim 50a of the verse in, Zechari in, the verse of the verse in Zechariah 14.6. And in that day there shall, be, there shall not be precious light and kippa on. Rav Eliezer said, This means the light, which is precious in this world, will be of little account, kafu, in the world to come. Back to the text. This precious light in Kippa'on, which are the secrets of the Torah, and invaluable in this world, will be of little account, that is, be easily understood, in the world to come. Only then will the details of these matters be revealed. At any rate, there is no contradiction whatsoever between the Torah and any of the world's scientific knowledge. We do not have to accept theories as certainties, no matter how widely accepted, for they are like blossoms that fade. Very soon, scientific technology will be further, de further developed, and all of today's new theories will be derided and scorned, and the respected wisdom of our day will seem small-minded. But the word of God will endure forever, for the mountains may depart and the hills be broken, but my faithful love shall never depart from you, nor my covenant of peace be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. That's from Ishayahu 54.10. The basis of all we teach the world is that everything is the work of God, and the means by which everything is made, whether few or many, even tens of thousands, are all God's actions. He left nothing lacking in his world. There is no end to his strength, his power of wisdom and his glory. Blessed be he, and blessed be his name forever. Sometimes explicit reference is made to the means in order to
to expand knowledge. At other times we omit their mention and say, God formed and God made, just as we say, and then Solomon built. Rather than say that Solomon gave the order to the ministers, and the ministers in turn to their subordinates, and they to the architects, and the architects to the craftsmen, and the labourers, for this is as obvious as it is secondary. Similarly, the many ways and means of creation that will be discovered in the coming tens of thousands of years, which will add to our knowledge of God's glory, will still fall short of the full truth. The crux of the matter is that the time of the appearance and the effects of every idea and thought is predetermined. Nothing is haphazard. For example, we can understand that if the fact of the globe's movement was made known to the masses a few thousand years ago, man would have feared to stand on his feet lest he fall from the force of the earth's movement. All the more so would he have feared building tall buildings. A general faint-heartedness and incalculably thwarted development would have resulted. The notion of a gravitational force would not have assured him, having seen with his own eyes that anything standing on a moving object cannot be secure from falling. Only after mankind matured through experience was it proper to allow men to recognise the Earth's movement, so that from it only good would come to man. This idea applies to spirituality as well. For example, the notion of God's involvement in man's world is the basis of mankind's morality and success. When this notion is clearly understood, sorry, when this notion is clearly understood in the world, it will be the foundation of life's happiness. In all of my sacred mount, 